Good morning. Welcome back. I'm Warner, Warner Orthopedics and the Well Theory and the Healing Soul. And I know we have been absent for a bit with the talks, but I wanted to say thank you for sticking with us and coming back to listen into this talk. We're going to get back on our regular schedule now. I've been working on a book actually, which will be coming out um, this spring. And that took a lot of my time. Um, and it's going to be about how to treat orthopedic, most orthopedic elected problems with natural methods, so to speak, so that you can avoid things like surgery and drugs. Um, today, we're going to talk about one of those methods, which is exercise. And I know a lot of people get intimidated and scared when they hear that term, mostly because of all the crazy people out there who are so extreme about exercise. Um, but I'm here to tell you, it doesn't have to be like that. And there's minimum things you can do to dramatically improve your health and wellness, and more importantly, make you feel good. So we're going to talk about exercise and then briefly touch also on how it affects inflammation, which if any of you are my regular viewers, you know that I'm a strong believer that chronic low-grade inf inflammation and chronic oxidative stress uh, is the fundamental problem with human disease because it dramatically decreases a function of the mitochondria, helps with insulin resistance, and all of that leads to most of our so-called lifestyle diseases. But exercise is one of the best ways to treat all of these and prevent them. So again, that's me, um, Dr. Warner. This is my clinic uh, where I treat people in Baton Rouge. Um, and then I also teach for LSU orthopedics part-time in New Orleans. All right. So today we're going to talk about exercise. What is it? Why do we do it? It seems stupid, right? Why do we get up and go stand on a machine that moves in fancy sweat clothes and make ourselves move until we sweat, right? Other societies look at us and they probably think we're insane. Why is it good for you? What does it actually do to help you? Does it prevent anything? Is there really a reason for me to do it? And if so, what's the best type of exercise and how should I do it and how long should I do it? Does it actually help me live longer? What should I do for longevity and health? And what do I do to stop hurting and have pain? Because you know, exercise hurts. And will it hurt my joints? Because my doctors told me to not exercise because I have arthritis and it would just make my joints worse. We're gonna talk about all of this, okay? So what is it? Technically, the definition is an activity that requires physical effort carried out to sustain or improve health and fitness. So it's gotta be physical, effortful, and intentional, okay? So in other words, it's not just your day-to-day -day movement that you have to do um, to live your life. That is non-exercise activity. We're talking about effortful and physical activity. And then why do we do this? And did we always do this as humans? And do we really even need to do this? So what is exercise as opposed to regular physical activity? Well, physical activity is any bodily movement. So this is physical activity right here, produced by skeletal muscle. So remember you have skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and then you have smooth muscle. Smooth muscles is what makes your food move along the digestive tract, things like that. Skeletal muscle is a muscle that typically your brain has some involvement in voluntary control. So physical activity is any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscle that results in energy expenditure. So this could be fidgeting. And actually, believe it or not, Fidgeting alone reduces all-cause mortality by about 30%. So people that are heavy fidgeters are actually healthier than non-fidgeters in terms of all-cause reasons for death. Uh, cooking and cleaning is a physical activity. Moving around the house just to, like, I don't know, arrange your closet or whatever. Working can be physical activity, depending on your job, of course. And then playing is probably one of the best things. So... You know, we have a huge problem with childhood obesity in this country, and one of the best ways we could combat that is with encouraging outside physical activity playtime for kids. Um, this is especially important in like elementary school and grade schools. The more physical activity kids do, the better they do in terms of their academic performance. So recess and exercise is massively important and play is part of that um, and should not be discounted as just leisure time for kids. It's really, really important for their brain and their body. Exercise is just a subset of physical activity. Again, it's in intentional, it's planned, it's structured, and generally it's repetitive, okay? And the final outcome goal of exercise is the improvement or maintenance of physical fitness, as opposed to the primary goal of physical activity is really just to live your life, okay? 
Okay, so why do we exercise? Other societies don't exercise, right? Why do Americans feel compelled to exercise? Well, because we have very sedentary lives now. So work is easier than it's ever been. Most companies really strive to make the work life or the work activities as efficient and lean as possible so that there's very little time spent between tasks. So that increases uh, output and revenues versus um, production costs. So what that means is work is easier than ever. More robots are being used, more assistive devices, et cetera, et cetera. We drive everywhere nowadays, correct? This Our country was built after more or less, you know, I'm exaggerating, but our country was purpose built for the car. So the car was invented by us, perfected by us. And then um, all of our cities and society was built around the car as opposed to the very historic societies in other countries where walking was the norm. So we drive everywhere here. Well, now, nowadays we sit in front of computers all day. And if we're not sitting in front of the computer, we're doing, this is the level of physical activity of most Americans right now, especially teenagers. And we wonder why 50% are obese. And then deliveries of everything. You could get your pizza delivered, you could get your groceries delivered, you could get your medication delivered. In this state, you can get your medical marijuana delivered. Everything can be delivered, right? So basically we're sedentary. So we lack physical activity in general. So what do we have to do? Exercise to regain some of that physical activity that is so necessary for life and health. Does everyone exercise on the planet? All eight or nine billion, I lost count. No. Some lives are way more active than others. Here's a picture of somebody in China building a building somewhere. There's hunter gatherers. There's subsistence farmers. The last slide I had a picture of a dairy farmer milking cows. That is not our life anymore. But back just what, 50, 60 years ago, most people would wake up, milk a cow, do something with the chicken coop, go to work, come back, do something else with the field and the garden. This is not our life now. Now we pick up the phone and get a delivery from Whole Foods or whatever. Okay, developing nations, very active on a day-to-day -day basis. Most places don't have elevators. Most places don't have cars. So you're walking everywhere. You're going up and down stairs, so on and so forth. And then the lower um, amount of physical activity, the unhealthier you are, the more all-cause mortality or reasons to die, et cetera. And this slide just shows you how many people even meet the bare minimum 2018 guidelines for physical activity in our country. It's pretty tragic. Uh, most of us are not meeting these guidelines, okay? This just shows you the group. So in the elderly group, which is gray, 65 and over, only about 10% of women are meeting the bare minimum physical activity guidelines, 15% of men. Um, and then go down to the light green, 50 to 64 year olds. It's uh, not that much better. Um, really the best group is the 18 to 34 year olds, probably because they're still out there playing sports and whatnot. And even there, it's not even half are meeting the bare minimum physical activity guidelines to be healthy. And we wonder why we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world. Okay. So the real key to health is physical activity in general, not necessarily exercise. We exercise because we lack physical activity. Not to say exercise is bad for you because I'm gonna tell you why it's really good for you. But if you live a uh, life in a developing nation and you're very heavily active, you do a lot of aerobic activity and you're lifting heavy things and just part of your day-to-day -day life, in general, you don't need to add the intent, uh, the intentional, purposeful, repetitive treadmill running at the end of the day, okay? It's not needed, but we do need it. Our occupational energy expenditure has declined since the 1960s, and this graph shows you that. So the amount of activity that we used to do at work has dramatically declined. Household management energy has dramatically declined. Now we've got robot vacuums, we've got dishwashers, we've got clothes washers, and nobody hangs our clothes out to dry anymore. Uh, we have vacuums, nobody sweeps. So all of the activity level needed even to maintain your house has decreased. And guess what the CDC doesn't track? Sitting. So they'll track other things, but they don't track the things that really matter for health, which is like, how much are we just sitting on our butts all day? Particularly leisure time. Leisure time sitting is way worse for you than sitting at work, okay? Just the sitting at work has not been shown to affect health outcomes. But when you get home from work, if you just sit on the couch and watch TV, get your food delivered, somebody and you're watching Netflix, that's what is killing people. And then the interesting thing to think about this too, since World War II, the amount of effort and energy required at work has dramatically decreased. But for some reason, 
osteoarthritis levels have dramatically increased. Now you've been taught, and I was taught previously that osteoarthritis is a wear and tear or an injury disease, but it's not because we're wearing and tearing far less than we ever used to, but more and more people have this problem. Turns out exercise and activity is actually protective from arthritis as is protective from all non-communicable diseases. So how is exercise good for you? So it's amazingly good for brain health. Um, people in developing nations where they're much more physically active have a 20 fold lower rate of Alzheimer's disease, for example. Um, exercise, when you flex your muscles and load your bones, you release substances like osteocalcin. And then in turn, other substances like brain derived uh, neutrotrophic factor, BDNF, I think I got the acronym right, that those levels increase and your neurons have a healthier life. So there's more neurons, they're healthier, they repair themselves better. So brain health is dramatically linked to exercise. That's really the primary reason you should exercise, if you want my opinion, is to keep your brain healthy. Bone health also dramatically linked to exercise. Longevity, dramatically linked to exercise. And stress management. Stress management is critical, uh, particularly in our t lives today. And one of the best ways to manage stress is to exercise. And then it also reduces levels of tumor necrosis factor alpha and CRP, both of which are highly associated with dying of cardiovascular having cardiovascular disease, and having long-term non-communicable diseases like Alzheimer's, cancer, diabetes, dementia, arthritis. All of that's linked to inflammation, like we said in the very beginning of this talk, and exercise dramatically reduces the levels of the damaging cytokines over time. So in 1953, Morris sort of kick-started the whole world of exercise science. He did a study, and I think it was in London, bus drivers versus ticket collectors on whatever their public transportation was. The ticket collectors over the time period developed far less cardiovascular disease than the drivers did. And then that began the boom of exercise science because Morris re re realized in the study that just the level of activity of the ticket collectors going up and down collecting people's tickets on the bus or the train preserved their lives versus the bus drivers who never got out of the seat. Okay, and then over time, we've learned that active jobs are associated with way better health outcomes than sedentary jobs, assuming you're not a shift worker, smoking, and doing all kind of crazy stuff when you get home from work, of course. But in general, an active job is much healthier than a sedentary In the 1960s, scientists discovered that the patients that, that had been referred to cardiac rehab programs after a heart attack or after um, cardiac bypass surgery ended up having a far lower risk of death and a far lower risk of recurrent heart problems than the groups that did not go to cardiac rehab. So think about that. This is 1960s, people had a heart attack and I'm sure all the doctors were scared to death of telling the people to go exercise, right? But turns out the ones that do exercise do better. So if your heart, which has to pump the entire time you're exercising and it pumps faster when you're exercising, if that actually does better with exercise, why do some orthopedic doctors still tell patients to not go use your body when you have orthopedic problems? I mean, the, there's a fundamental disconnect here. So the, so the 1950s and 1960s are starting to learn more and more. And then in the 1980s, there were two huge meta-analyses where they gathered all of the other studies and then sort of broke them down and this, this study analyzed the studies. They've proved the fact that an active job is better than a sedentary job and people live longer and feel better and are happier and have less diseases. And then overall, the number of metabolic equivalents or activity levels correlates with your health. So that's the early evidence, okay? And this just keeps building on itself. So the Cooper Clinic looked at about 10,000 patients and they found a dose relationship between mortality and the metabolic equivalent levels. So dose dependent, this is just like a drug, right? The more you take, the better you do um, up to a certain point, of course. Each one unit of metabolic equivalent increased in, in your capacity, your exercise ability uh, was associated with a 12% reduction in mortality. I cannot think of many drugs that have that power. A single increase in your metabolic equivalent capacity reduces your risk of death by, death by 12%. And then the most important thing to remember about all of this, which we're just now realizing, is that skeletal muscle and actually bone too 
are actually endocrine organs. So we think of endocrine organs like the thyroid, the ovaries, the pituitary gland that spit out hormones that affect other body parts. They're like messaging signals. Well, muscle does the same thing and so does bone. If you use your muscle, it's sending out myokines and different proteins that cause different events and different organ systems. The same thing happen, happens with bone. So exercise is massively important for all of your systems to function well and for you to be very happy and healthy as you get a little bit older. We don't wanna be sitting around hurting, right? And miserable and not able to play with our grandkids. The best medicine out there for this is exercise. So it can reduce the top 10 causes of death, the top 10 prevalent conditions in our country, and then the top most costly conditions. So you would ask yourself, why is society not promoting more exercise if it will save society money in the long run? There might be some answers to that that are a bit cynical. Uh, it's difficult to patent exercise. You can't really package it and sell it. Um, and it takes a lot of personal accountability. Like people actually have to get out and do it themselves. They can't just pop a pill. So it's not like marketed and it's not pushed and it's not super popular, but it would save our country massive dollars if people would just get off their duff and get out there and move a little bit. The National Cancer Institute looked at 650,000 patients or so and found a steep decline in death. This is the Cancer Institute. Steep decline in death with, with uh, 3.74 metabolic equivalents. So an increase from doing nothing to 3.74 metabolic equivalents per week of physical activity. What does that mean? That was just brisk walking 11 minutes a day. And in the Cancer Institute of 650,000 people, death rates dropped by 20%. So 11 minutes a day, think about that. And you're at the Cancer Institute, which probably means there's something maybe metabolically wrong with you and just 11 minutes of walking a day. And it doesn't have to be 11 minutes together. That could be five minutes and six minutes. Just that is enough. That, that is all that you have to do to get much better in terms of your health. So you don't have to go to Zumba class. You don't have to go to Pilates. You don't have to go running. You don't have to buy all the cycling gear and get a Peloton. You don't have to look like Hercules. All you gotta do is walk 11 minutes a day and you're gonna see dramatic improvements in your health. A metabolic equivalent is just a made up unit of measure of your exercise capacity. So 11 minutes of walking a day is about 3.74 metabolic equivalents. It's just a made up unit. This is a picture of the UK biobank where they store tissue and um, genetic material from thousands and thousands of people in the, in the United Kingdom. And they study it and along with the people themselves and they've been studying them for years. So we've, we've learned a lot from the UK Biobank. They studied a bunch of people with wrist accelerometers, which are the little things you wear on your wrist that measure activity, um, like a fit, Fitbit or whatever. And this is a study of almost 80,000 people. And again, they found a dose response for physical activity and all cause mortality. So the more exercise you did, the less likely you will die or have any bad disease. And then also they accounted for step number and purposeful steps versus incidental steps. And then as also how fast you walked. Okay. Hi, James. Oh, Janie. Sorry, I thought you said James. Okay, I'm done with this slide. Thank you. All right, this is just showing you what the biobank does. So they look at all the primary care data. They've got all these researchers involved. They do whole ge genome sequencing. They check all the proteins. I mean, this is a massive amount of data collection over time of people. So a lot of the results, assuming that the statistics are done properly out of this particular um, research effort is pretty awesome. And it's given us a lot of good insights into human health. Oh my God. Okay. Sorry. I've been reminded to remind you that if you want to win the free gift, you have to like the talk and share it and feel free to comment and ask questions. Cause that's what I like. All right, go on. Okay. So enough about how 
good it is for you. You know that, right? You know it's going to reduce your risk of death. It's going to reduce your risk of dementia. But if you're 40, 50, you're feeling okay, you know, how you feel when you're 70 or 80 is sort of nebulous. It's esoteric. It's like, who really cares? A lot of people don't. But I'm going to tell you that you will feel much better today. You will have less pain. You will sleep better. You'll be more productive. You'll be happier. And you'll interact with your friends and family much better. So there's aerobic activity anaerobic activity and resistance training, <clears throat> okay? The 2018 guidelines produced by the government uh, were based on 23 studies. So um, there's thousands written why they picked the 23 they picked. They had their criteria. They picked these 23 studies. And they basically found that the bouts of activity can be more or less than 10 minutes in duration in general. So this is important because the 2008 guidelines said that Exercise doesn't count unless you do at least 10 minutes in a row or more. Well, 10 years later, we realized that's not true. You can do less than 10 minutes at a time and still gain benefit. So you don't have to freak out if you're completely sedentary and out of shape that you have to go run <clears throat> or walk for 30 minutes to get any benefit. You don't. You can go for four or five minutes. Okay. And then over time, you'll get better and better and you'll add more and more minutes, right? So the bouts of activity can be more or less than 10 minutes duration. And then longer duration can make up for lower intensity. So there's different zones or different levels of activity that we're going to talk about. Let's say you're only able to do one or two and you can never go to three, four or five. Well, you just do one or two a little bit longer and you're going to get pretty good overall health benefits um, that would make up for short bouts of three or four. And I'm going to explain all that later. But basically, the point of this slide is to tell you, just get out there and move a little bit. That is going to be really, really helpful to you. OK, aerobic activity is when you use oxygen during the consumption of fuel. Remember, fuel is food that's converted by your body into ATP, which is our currency of energy. So aerobic activity would include like running, quick walking, swimming, cycling, dancing. Aerobic activity is zone one through four, effectively, and then zone five, uh, which is your max VO2, uh, which is like the most intense you could do, becomes anaerobic because your fat cannot be broken down to make ATP fast enough to provide the fuel needed for zone five. So you end up using phosphocreatine and um, glucose and glycogen stored in the muscle. For fat burning, to burn your triglycerides and your free fatty acids running around, zone two is by far the most efficient. And it's also the best for improving your mitochondrial health over time. And there are studies and anecdotes showing that people that were health disasters in their 30s and 40s, when they started exercising in their 50s, they were able to revert their mitochondria back to the health of a normal 30-year-old. So also, you don't have to worry if you've never exercised and you're 50 or 60 what you do now can actually reverse badness that has happened in your body and make your mitochondria younger. And all of health and disease is contingent upon the, the function of your mitochondria. So zone two turns out to be the best way to get good mitochondrial health. Also the best way to burn fat. Okay. We have a few comments. Yeah, so Miss Overton said it's good to know that she could start with 11 minutes that her nurse, she said NPs, so I assume she means nurse practitioners, told her that 30 minutes is what she needs to make a difference. So yeah, that's been disproven. That is not true. Um, they're probably going off of the basic CDC recommendations of 150 minutes a week, which is five days of 30 minutes a day, um, which is the recommended level of activity. But you can break that 30 minutes into 10 minute increments. This is what I tell my patients. You can just get up at work and walk five minutes every hour and you've already hit 40 minutes of activity in an eight hour day. And that's perfectly acceptable and you will see benefits. But if you have done nothing and you're just trying to get in the game, then go do 10 minutes. It's still better than nothing by far. Oh. Deborah asked if the stationary peddlers have any value other than keeping your leg moving and pumping your blood. Um, 
those two features are very valuable. Remember I told you just fidgeting reduces all cause mortality by 30%. So I think if you're gonna sit and do a stationary peddler while you're doing whatever work you're doing, that again is better than doing nothing. Will you hit the heart rate necessary for zone two and to improve your mitochondrial health? Probably not, but you're still doing more than just sitting. You're still using skeletal muscle. You're still loading bone. So it's still beneficial. Yes, you can always supplement to help your mitochondria. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Okay. Thomas, who's 79, says he walks a mile each day as measured by his Fitbit. That's awesome. Um, and I'm going to tell you how you know you're in zone two in a minute here, Thomas. Yeah. Okay. So these are the exercise zones. So there's red is the highest or five. And then uh, light yellow, moderate maintenance warm up is one. So one, two, three, four, five. And then on the left, where it says beats per minute, you see 50%, 60%, 70, 80, 90, 100. So 100% 100 would be your VO2 max. So that's the most intense activity that you personally are capable of. So like sprinting as fast as you possibly can, um, cycling as fast as you can, those kind of things. Um, most people can only do that top level for maybe 20 to 30 seconds, if you're lucky, okay? Um, as you become more and more of an elite athlete, they can do that a little bit longer. Most of life is spent in maintenance and warm up. Zone two is that 60 to 70, okay? That weight control, fitness, fat burn. Um, I call that color baby diarrhea, that kind of awful yellow. So between aerobic and moderate is zone two. So I'm, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that, but obviously most of us are not gonna go out and find what our heart rate is at our VO2 max and then do the mathematical equations required to get to 60% of that, I'm gonna tell you it's not that accurate anyway because everybody's different. So if you're anemic, you're gonna have um, a different VO2 max than if you're not anemic. You know, If you've got um, stiffness of your Achilles tendon, you're not gonna be able to achieve the speed you would otherwise. Like there's a million reasons and variables and factors that would make that mathematical equation, I think, inaccurate. So I'm gonna give you a very dumbed down, simple way to know if you're in zone two. Um, we can, I think it's on the next slide. This is the formula I'm talking about. This is a bit ridiculous. I would not do this, but a lot of people do, the, do this. And I know there's a lot of exercise buffs out there that live and die by all this stuff, but I don't. So 220 minus your age, that is in theory, your maximum heart rate. Again, not set in stone. And then your recovery rate would be 60 to 70% of that. Your aerobic would be 70 to 80% of that, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I don't want to do math if I'm exercising um, unless I'm trying to train my brain for some reason. Um, so I just do the other way to check if you're zone two, which, next slide, is um, if you can hold a conversation with a little bit of difficulty, you're in zone two. So in other words, you're able to talk but it's not like, like you can't talk like I'm talking right now with no problem, I'm not short of breath, no issues, I don't have to <gasps> between. But if, if you're like, pretend like you're on a fast walk with your buddies and you're trying to talk and it's just a little bit hard to hold that conversation, you're in zone two. And that's the easiest, most simple, what are you doing? Stop. That is the easiest, most simple way to know that you're in zone two, okay? Um, one trick I do, uh, when I go for long walks or go for a walk is, um, and I'm not saying do this cause you need to know your own fitness if you're going to do this or not, but I'll hold my breath for 20 steps and may, you know, like do different things to stress my system to get my heart rate up to zone two. Okay. Um, so zone two, just remember that if you can talk, but it's not the easiest thing in the world to talk, you're probably in zone two. And that is your best mitochondrial training level and your best fat burning level. And that's where you want to do that 11 minutes of brisk walking at that zone two level. And you don't have to be Wonder Woman, Gil Gadot here. You, don't, you just need to move a little bit. Get out there and play some pickleball with your buddies. Go for a brisk walk. Get up and uh, sweep instead of vacuuming. You know, just start thinking about opportunistic exercise. If it's one flight of stairs, take it. Don't take the elevator. And then, you know, maybe in a month you could do two flight of stairs. Start thinking about things like that. Any movement is better than no movement for your health and wellness to make your joints feel good, to make your brain better. Okay, 
So zone two is a great place to start. So the Lancet, which is a very important journal that's out of Europe, uh, in the health longevity study in 2023, which is now, uh, they found that our human ability to walk and talk at the same time starts to decline at the age of 55. And we know people that have trouble walking and talking, right? And this seems to be related to diminishing brain function, okay? Your goal when you're walking should be to hold a conversation with mild difficulty, okay? And there's an important reason for this. Not only does it tell you you're in zone two, but you're doing two things at once. You're doing a mental activity and a physical. So two activities simultaneously make your brain work harder. It stresses your motor control system. It's called dual task cost. And this is critical to brain function. So for your brain to maintain health, you have to, you have to exercise your brain too. And talking while you're walking makes your brain split up its activity, um, I guess, energy consumption and its resources in two different areas and manage that. And so this is a great way to keep yourself from getting age-related dementia is going for walks with friends and talking or going for a walk, maybe listening to podcasts, just doing something where you have, you're doing two things at once, where you have a dual task effort, okay? Super, super important. And that also will tell you if you're in zone two. Okay, so a lot of people think that doctors tell you to lose weight or to exercise to lose weight. And maybe some of your doctors do. I don't do that. Exercise is not a great way to lose weight. Um, I put this slide to show you, to give you a visual of what I'm about to talk about. Herman Ponsler, who's a great scientist who studied energy expenditure um, in the humans for years and years now, found that the energy expenditure of the hunter-gatherer population, like the Hadza people, which is shown on the bottom, these are the people that have to forage for berries and they chase the antelope for days before they kill it so they don't eat meat that often, you know, and they might happen upon some bees and get some honey periodically, but they're working hard to get their food. They're walking 10,000 steps like every few hours. Um, super, super active. Turns out they burn the same amount of calories per day as the picture above, which depicts a sedentary office worker. Okay. And they studied groups of sedentary office workers in Illinois and compared them to the hot to hunt, or maybe it wasn't the hot sub, but a hunter gatherer tribe burned the same number of calories per day regardless. Out humans have a set level and we exist within that level no matter what. So if you start training for a marathon, you may expend a few more calories per day during that first week or two of training, but then your body's going to adapt. It's going to reallocate resources. You're going to use less here and less there to support the activity of the exercise. And you're, you're not going to burn any more calories. Also, our food in this country is so dense uh, one protein bar will take out pretty much an hour or two of exercise for most of us. So I am not here to tell you to exercise to lose weight. I think that's going to be frustrating, um, detrimental, and give you a lot of psychological angst because this is not going to work. What you should exercise for is to feel good and to be happy and to keep your brain healthy. And that's it. Okay? It is very good for dementia pre prevention very terrible for weight loss. It's very good to prevent heart attacks, very terrible for weight loss. It's very good to help with the pain of arthritis and prevent arthritis, very terrible for weight loss. That little picture there is named Emma, and this is the author who produced her, William Higgum, I believe. And that is his assumption of what we will all look like in 20 years, the typical office worker. A hunched back, sore eyes, a protruding stomach, varicose veins. And it, but he based this on current data and the trends in data. 50% of UK workers report eye problems. Same in America. 49% report bad backs. Same in America. And interestingly, there's no wear and tear, right? No injuries. But everybody still has back pain. Everybody still has bad eyes, et cetera, et cetera. Exercise is protective and will protect all of this, okay? And keep you healthy and keep you from ending up looking like Emma. And for back pain, the number one way to get rid of back pain is to have a strong back. So a lot of people think that, um, you know, you have to have these ergonomic chairs that have to keep this lumbar curved and all this. And turns out that's never been proven. All the studies don't show that. They're nice chairs. They're comfortable. But really, the only way to keep yourself from having back pain and to help your back pain is to strengthen your back. So people that sit on backless chairs actually have 20 to 40% stronger backs than the people that use 
the ones with the ergonomic curves. So just keep that in mind too. So again, anything is better than nothing. Five to 10 minutes a day turns out to be 35 to 70 minutes a week. And the biggest health benefits have been found between zero and 90 minutes a week. So people that do nothing, if they get up to somewhere around 90 minutes a week, anywhere in between that, they have massive health benefits. Going from 90 minutes a week to 150 minutes a week, a little bit more benefit, not as tremendous as that initial work. So just five to 10 minutes a day. So I, I want everybody to just forget everything you learned, just get out there and move a little bit. Walk once around the block and it's gonna be better. You're gonna feel better and you're gonna have a healthier brain than you did before. 30 minutes for three days a week gets you that 150 minutes a week recommended by the CDC. That is your zone two walk and talk. That's why the NP of the other lady who asked a question before told her you have to do 30 minutes a day. You don't have to do 30 minutes a day. You, your goal is to hit 150 minutes, but zero to 90 minutes a week will give you amazing health benefits. So please don't be discouraged and intimidated by people that tell you you have to do this or you're not going to. It doesn't matter. It does matter. Okay, anaerobic activity. So we just talked about aerobic, the use of oxygen while you're consuming fuel. Anaerobic, you're using stored energy and uh, breaking it down in a non-oxidative phosphorylation way. So you're not using the electron transport chain with oxygen, okay? Phosphocreatine will give you about 10 seconds of energy. Glycogen, that is uh, big molecules of stored glucose within your muscle, that will last about 80 minutes. So most people think it's 80 to 120, and I believe, yeah, the number of kilocalories the average human stores in glycogen is 1,800 to 2,000, and that's it. And then you run out of glycogen, so you either have to use the glucose that's in your blood or you start burning fat. Now, I will tell you that your, your body wants to preserve most of the glucose in your blood for your brain, so it's going to preferentially go to free fatty acids of glycogen usually. So the anaerobic is really that high level five zone, the VO2 max. Um, fast, short duration, this is your high intensity interval training. You may have heard people talk about HIT. This is when you do like the box jumpies here that I'm showing on the bottom, or your sprint cycling, or you go for a sprint. Um, anything that's super high intense and get your heart rate up to that max um, where you can't speak, there's no way you would be able to say a word. You're working that hard. You're only going to be able to do that for a few seconds. That's your anaerobic phase. Okay. It's very important for developing speed and power, and it has a lot of other health benefits. Um, but again, for the average person in America, don't worry about this right now. You just got to get out there and walk five to 10 minutes a day and hopefully every day, but you don't even have to do it every day. So quick review of metabolism, just so you know what I'm talking about. You are what you eat. So that wives tale is in fact quite true. You absorb nutrients. Insulin is produced based on the nutrients that are absorbed in your stomach. And then that fuel that is absorbed from your stomach and intestines is eventually broken down. It's either used, stored as glycogen or stored as fat. And then it generates ATP, which is again, the only way our body can actually use energy. And it requires very healthy mitochondria to do this properly. And exercise with use of skeletal muscle can change all the parameters of whether you're using glycogen, whether you're using fat, how much glucose is pulled out, your insulin sensitivity. So exercise dramatically affects your metabolism as does nutrition. Okay, just real quick, the Krebs cycle. This is when your food is broken down initially and then uh, acetyl-CoA is produced, which is a two carbon molecule made from glucose, which is six carbon, which is broken to pyruvate, which is three each, I believe. And then that goes to the two carbon molecule. It then combines with a four carbon molecule to form the six carbon citrate, okay? And this cycle just goes on and on and on. And as this cycle goes on, electrons are pulled off of the molecules, put onto NAD. You've probably heard us talk about NAD. I supplement with NMN to increase my levels of NAD because of this. You have to have NAD to get reduced. It has to pull an electron out of the food and it brings it to the mitochondria, to the electron transport chain, which then makes ATP. So if you don't have efficient, good functioning NAD, you're not gonna have healthy functioning mitochondria or it won't be as efficient. Coenzyme Q is another one that helps shuttle electrons along the electron transport chain. And you may or may not remember this, but electrons are energy. 
That is how all energy is moved around. That's what's passing in the power lines around your house. And that's what's working in your body. Okay. So the Krebs cycle is important. It basically recycles these molecules by way of different enzymes and then NAD and then another molecule FAD just pull the electrons off and bring them to the electron transport chain where they do their magic and we make ATP. The waste products of the cycle are carbon dioxide and water. And so again, you're just part of the globe. You're part of the universe. Everything on earth runs on carbon. Everything is all about carbon and photons energy, okay? The plants make the carbon from the photonic energy of the sun. We make energy from the bonds and the carbon that the plant make. We make the ATP, then we breathe out the carbon dioxide that the plants use. They take that carbon and make their glycogen filled things such as fruit. We eat it and it's a cycle that goes on and on. But all of the energy really starts and ends with the sun, the photons. So NAD is super, super important. And as we age, it's depleted. That's why one of the ways to supplement and help your performance and your ability to do exercise would be probably, I think, to take NMN. That's my opinion. Now, the electron carriers, the NAD and the FAD, move the electrons to this, which is the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain sits in the membrane of the mitochondria. The mitochondria, you may or may not remember, is an organelle inside of a cell. So it's, a, it's like a little um, factory that sits inside of almost every cell, okay? And that's what makes the energy that allows the cell to function, and then that energy is shared and used for various functions. But the energy can only be made if the mitochondria works well. If all of these cytochromes, those little um, proteins that are embedded in the cell membrane are functioning properly, if you're getting enough NAD to bring the electrons over, if the Krebs cycle is working well. So the mitochondria has to be finely tuned, healthy, young, no um, bad broken parts. The cell membrane has to be nice and fluid. Omega-3 helps with that, okay? Omega-3 keeps the cell membrane very healthy and fluid and flexible. Um, and then the electron transport chain allows you to use oxygen to make fuel, which gives you the ability to do aerobic zone two exercise. And the ATP is basically just adenosine, which has phosphate groups added. ATP is triphosphate, three phosphate groups. Each of those bonds is very hard to make and holds a lot of energy. And that's why ATP is used by our body. It goes where it's needed. The bond is broken, the energy, the electrons are released. So that's just a brief review of the metabolism so you understand all of this aerobic, anaerobic, high intensity, yada, yada. So again, high intensity is anaerobic, glycogen or phosphocreatine broken down or straight glucose, right, from the bloodstream. Aerobic is when you're using fatty acid breakdown or lipolysis. So when adipose tissue sends out a triglyceride, which is broken down to free fatty acids, and then we use that through the mitochondria. Only the mitochondria can do fatty acid oxidation. Um, and then we make ATP that way. And fat is very efficient way to store fuel. You don't have to store it with water, so it weighs less ironically, and it's nine calories per gram versus carbs, which is like four calories per gram. And then resistance, weightlifting, which we're going to talk about, uses glycogen, glucose, phosphocreatine, and then if you're doing long-term resistance training, probably some fatty acids too. Immediate energy is a phosphogen system. Short-term energy is a glycolytic system, the breakdown of glycogen, which is again stored in your muscle. And your muscle can only use the glycogen stored in it so like your forearm muscle isn't going to use glycogen from your calf muscle. If your forearm muscle runs out of glycogen, it needs to use fatty acids. And then long-term energy is your aerobic activity. Your zone two is going to use free fatty acids. And then glucose uptake from the blood happens when skeletal muscle is stimulated and using, and that peaks at around 60 to 90 minutes. So one of the best ways you can reduce your blood glucose levels, like let's say you're diabetic, is to go for a walk after a meal. Just using muscle and having the muscle function will actually bring more of what's called the GLUT4 receptor to the surface and pulls more glucose out of the blood. And then eventually your metabolism will shift to fatty acids. And actually sleep is where you burn a lot of fatty acids too. Okay, so skeletal muscle, hugely important for glucose management, all right? This is why a lot of type 1 diabetics can really help manage their blood glucose levels with um, regular repetitive physical activity, uh, because remember, they don't have pancreas or their pancreas is not functioning that well. So one of the best ways to pull glucose out of the blood so it doesn't cause problems is to exercise. That GLUT4, that squiggly purple thing there, that is the receptor 
or it, it gets actually put to the surface when the body senses the muscles being used. And that allows glucose to drop into the muscle cell to be used to burn as fuel, or if it's not needed to store as glycogen. Without that GLUT4 receptor, that doesn't happen, okay? And then the liver will continue to make glucose as needed. That's called gluconeogenesis or glyco glycogenolysis when the liver breaks down liver glycogen to make glucose as needed to put it in the bloodstream. And then also the liver can make glucose from both proteins and fat. After about three to four hours of continuous exercise, free fatty acids will be the primary fuel source, assuming you're not going to run into anaerobic. But after three to four hours of activity, it's usually really hard to hit that VO2 max. But basically all you need to know is the more you use muscle, the more you're going to pull glucose out of the bloodstream. And the more you're going to deplete free fatty acids and glycogen. And really, the best thing is you're going to make your mitochondria healthier. Oh, well, thanks, Missy. Missy said she's glad to see me back. I'm glad to be back, too. I like doing this. All right. Now I'm going to make it even more complicated, of course, because we're not talking about this much, but this could probably be its own talk, how hormones affect all of this. And then also what you eat right before you exercise affects what fuel source you use. So like if you ate a banana, you might use more glucose and glycogen than like, let's say if you ate a bunch of Greek yogurt or some scrambled eggs. So what you eat before you exercise can change the, the metabolic parameters that your body's going to use. Uh, and hormones, insulin, glucagon, catecholamines, and now you guys have probably all heard about Ozempic and all of those drugs that change the gut hormones, the incretins, which in turn change the levels of insulin. All of this matters. And then your adaptations from prior exercise. So if your body got used to burning glucose with certain types of exercise, it's going to be very efficient at that and very good at that. And maybe we'll have trouble burning free fatty acids backwards and forwards. So your adaptations from prior exercise and training matter. All of that modulates the metabolism. Um, and some of this is getting a little bit esoteric and getting into exercise science of, you know, elite athletes, which is where we learn a lot of this. Uh, but for purposes of human health and to prevent arthritis and to make your joints feel good, this probably doesn't matter. All you need to know is hit zone two a few minutes a day, and then we have to lift heavy things periodically. So let's get into a little bit more about that. So resistance exercise. Uh, Top shows American Gladiators. I don't know if anybody remembers them. Um, some of them were able to develop these physiques with additional hormone assistance, let's say. So the point of the slide is to tell you, you don't have to look like that. A lot of that's unnatural, okay, and um, steroid assisted. So <laughs> you just need to do some kind of resistance. So the bottom left is probably most of us in America, you know, uh, relatively high BMI individual just starting, who cares? Get out there and lift your four pound curl bar. Eventually you will be as strong as the guy on the right, right? So resistance is important in a number of ways for health, but when you're thinking about muscle strength or resistance training, you, there's different parameters. You could have endurance training. You could have hypertrophy, which is when you try to get bigger. You could train for strength. You could train for power. My preference for my patients is to get them to train for strength because most of the stuff you want to do when you're older, like sit on the floor and play with grandkids and get up. You want to be able to get out of a pool without needing too much help. You may be able to want to be able to carry your own groceries without asking for help. So a lot of that is just pure strength. Power is strength and velocity. So a lot of us, power is good and power is important. And it's been associated with a lot of beneficial things as you get older, but my primary focus for most of my patients, because most of my patients are sedentary, a lot of them never played sports. They don't even know what muscle soreness is. Um, I try to get them to focus more on strength because I think that gives you the most um, health results long term. And then, of course, if you're strong, we can start working on endurance and high power. I never really try to work on hypertrophy. I personally don't want to get bulky and big, and most of my patients don't either. Hypertrophy is important in some worlds, but for health and wellness, not so important. It's more important to be strong and have endurance followed by power and hypertrophy. So why do I focus on strength? Because of this sarcopenia, super common 
and commoner or more common as we age. So that MRI on the right is two thighs. The one on the left is a normal, young, healthy thigh muscle. The, the bright white circle in the middle is the femur bone. And then the gray is muscle. And then the dark gray is fat. The sarcopenic thigh muscle of the typical 50, 60, 70, 80 year old is the other one. You see how it's marbled with fat. It's less, it's less dense and there's way more fat around it. And the cartoon to the left of that is showing you the same depiction, but I see that MRI and backs and arms and necks all the time, marbled muscle that just looks terrible and it's um, small and it's just indicative of weakness. Um, I see sarcopenic muscles in um, backs all the time. People come see me for back pain all the time and it, in every MRI, all their muscle just looks like a big old ribeye, marbled steak, just filled with fat, which is a sign of insulin resistance and sarcopenia. So again, strength can fight this. Remember the human body is amazingly able to overcome and reverse all of this. You have plasticity. You have neuroplasticity and you have muscle plasticity. So if you start doing progressive overload or you just try to start lifting heavy things periodically, your body will adapt to that and you will grow better, stronger muscle. Okay. The impact of sarcopenia is horrible. This is why people get frail, weak, why they fall, why they get hip fractures, why they get demented because there's less muscle, things like that. So you really need to eat enough protein to support this. And then you need to do the work to get stronger. Most of us will lose three to 8% of our muscle mass every year, starting around age 40. So you have to fight this. And this is why we age. We age because we get weak. We don't get weak because we age. All right, so this uh, lady on the left in the red shirt is 81 and can bench press 115 pounds. Forget her name off right now, but she's a pretty famous um, bodybuilder. She's 81. Lady on the right, similar age group. So resistance training prevents sarcopenia and you don't have to worry if you've never lifted a weight in your life. You can do this because your body has the innate ability to do this. It just has to respond to the load. When astronauts go in space, they become osteoporotic because there's no load on the bones. The body says, eh, we don't need strong bone, pulls all the calcium out. Conversely, if you weight lift, the body says, eh, we need a lot more stronger bone, puts calcium into the bone. Your body's gonna respond to what environment you give it. If you give your body an environment of being a couch potato, that is the body you're gonna adapt, like you're going to adapt to that. So all you got to do is get out there and start doing a little bit of weightlifting. We'll talk about a couple of things you can do with weightlifting or resistance exercise. Um, a lot of times I'll tell people physical therapy or get a personal trainer, just somebody to muscle. So you become weaker and weaker and weaker, but you don't have to. We're having some internet issues. Even though I was told we had fiber optics. All right. So again, this guy's 90. I'm just telling you that you don't have to believe what you've been taught. Your body is capable of adapting and overcoming. The human body is amazing, can heal almost anything and can, can improve if given the chance. So what is the best type of exercise for you and for me? Is it aerobic, is it anaerobic, is it resistance? Really it's a combination of aerobic and resistance training. So in general, the recommendations today are 150 weekly minutes of aerobic zone two or three activity combined with two to three days of resistance training. Now remember, that 150 weekly minutes does not have to be in blocks of 30 minutes to be effective. You can do it in blocks of five minutes, whatever you need to do. And if you can't get to 150 minutes this week, that doesn't mean don't do anything. Remember I told you maximum health benefits were seen from the people that went from zero to anywhere up to 90 minutes a week. So going from zero to 10 minutes a week is still gonna benefit you more than doing nothing. And then two to three days of resistance training. Why just two to three days? Because when you, when you load the muscles, the body senses that, and there's actually changes in the nucleus at the genetic level that tells your body to make more protein. 
to support the load that the body thinks it's going to be hit with again. And that takes time. So when you do a lifting session, you want to give your body two to three days to recover for the protein synthesis. And that means, of course, you need to also be eating some protein. Okay. High intensity work is extremely beneficial, but it is not mandatory. What is mandatory is movement. So extreme exercise is neither helpful or harmful. So the extreme exercise enthusiasts, let them go, let them have it. I'm not one of them. It's not really helping them, but it's not really hurting them either. What is hurting people is leisure time inactivity. All right. So resistance, you want to do whole body movements. So I kind of broke, this is, this is different pyramids of weightlifting or strength training. So number one, adherence, you have to be consistent. Okay. You can't just lift once and then six months later lift again and think that you're going to get anything from that. You, this is something you do kind of have to commit to. Okay. So adherence, volume, intensity, frequency, progression, meaning you can't just lift a five pound curl bar for forever and think that you're going to keep building muscle and maintaining it. You do have pro progressively overload. So you would go from a five pound curl bar eventually to seven to 10 to 15, et cetera, et cetera. And then you're going to get to a point where you maintain and then you change up your exercises. So progressive overload is the basic fundamental principle of resistance training. For my purposes and from everything I've learned and read about and for strength, what you want to do is three to five sets of three to five exercises. So a set in the world of resistance training is uh, like, let's say you're doing push-ups. A set would be if you did 10 push-ups. So that would be 10 reps. 10 repetitions is your set. So let's say you're doing push-ups. You would do three sets of 10 push-ups. But really, you don't even need to do 10 push-ups. You could do three. So just remember three to five. So you want to do three to five sets of three to five exercises. You want to rest three to five minutes between the sets, and you want to do that three to five days a week. And you can do five days a week if you're doing different muscle groups, right? As long as each muscle group has time to recover and do that protein synthesis. So the easiest thing to do, three exercises, three sets, let's say three reps, three days a week. And for strength, what you want to do is 70% of your maximum one rep lift. And we can talk about that later. There's very simple um, little calculators that you can use to figure out your max one rep. Um, like let's say for bench press, your maximum is 100 pounds. For strength training, you would do 70 pounds. You would do three sets of three bench presses at 70 pounds three days a week. Okay. Yeah, somebody has a protein question. How much protein should you eat and what kind? So for bare minimum, for replacement of what your body breaks down and uses day to day, it's somewhere from 46 to 56 grams and that's it, which is not a lot. That's the bare minimum just for keeping your skin cells, your liver cells, et cetera, intestine, all that functioning correctly. If you're going to be lifting, you need to do a little bit more, probably, I don't know, 80 to 200 grams maybe. And I don't have that right in front of me. And then what kind of protein? Uh, I have no problem with animal protein or plant protein. Animal protein is way more efficient and denser. And plant protein, it's a lot harder to get the right proteins in enough quantity. Um, but when you're going to be eating animal protein, you just, I think, need to really avoid processed animal protein and you don't want anything corn fed um, fed in one of those high efficiency corn cattle factory things you just want grass finished don't don't fall for grass fed a lot of them are doing that now all beef is grass fed up until the last six months of their life where they jam corn into it to fatten it up give it insulin resistance to marble it and then they kill it and that's the beef you get so you want grass finished or cage free or organic, whatever, anything as close to nature as possible, those kind of animal proteins are probably the best. Um, but you're, it's not a lot for your bare minimum. Next. Okay. So here's some uh, options. I just wanted to kind of give you an idea. So the guy on top is holding kettleballs or a kettleball, and that is what's called a farmer's carry. 
So you can see that's working multiple whole groups and going through a whole joint range of motion. So you have to bend your knee, you're keeping your back straight, you're using your quads, your glutes, your calves, and your arm, you're picking up the kettlebell, and then you're going to walk with it. That is a great exercise. You can just walk up and down your driveway with a kettlebell, and there's one of your resistance training uh, exercises for the week, okay? And you don't have to start with, that's probably like a 30-pound kettlebell. You can just get a five-pound kettlebell. Don't have a kettlebell? Get a curl bar. Don't have a curl bar? Tie a string around a, a heavy thing in your house. Carry a gallon of milk. Whatever you need to do. Um, but it is important for you to fight the scourge of sarcopenia, okay? The deadlift is a great exercise. This is one I would not do without some initial guidance because if you don't do it properly, you do run the risk of getting your back muscles a bit sore and tweaking some ligaments. But the deadlift, again, you're using your core, using your glutes, you're using your chest, you're using your arms, you're using your quad, and you're working on the back strength that we talked about. And then the goblet squat, the guy on the bottom right. So you're just holding something, either a curl bar, maybe a kettlebell, could be a medicine ball, and you're squatting down keeping your back straight and picking up. So again, you're working multiple muscle groups at a, at a time. So you could just do those three, three sets of each with a weight that's effectively 70% of what you could lift once, like the heaviest thing you could lift once. Just do three sets of three with rest of three minutes in between. I mean, it would only take a few, a few minutes for a session. Um, but resistance training is hugely important. And I promise as you get stronger, you will feel about a thousand percent better. So the stronger you are, the better you feel, the better your brain works. Everything gets better with strength. Next. All right. So physical activity and years of life gain, not to belabor the point, but years of life gain, zero to five on the left or the y-axis of this thing. And the right with the big blocks is the percent of your HHS guidelines. That's at 150 of aerobic per week and two to three of resistance per week. If you're meeting 300% of that, so you're doing three times the minimum, you're gaining four to five years. And to me, this is very esoteric and not very meaningful. If you're 50 and you're thinking about gaining four years when you're 90, for me, it's more important for you to know you'll feel better, your brain's going to work better, you'll have more energy, you'll sleep better, and your joints and your muscles are just going to feel better. You're not going to have pain. So I think exercise is important for that. Yes, the side effect is a longer life. You will get that. Um, but I wouldn't focus on that. I would focus on how you feel here and now. So sedentary versus any movement again. So moderate, vigorous, leisure time, physical activity, that is your exercise. That's what we have to do in this country because we're not active enough in general. Your MVPA, your moderate, vigorous, leisure time, physical activity, and they're saying moderate, vigorous, I guess, to have more syllables and just saying zone two. But basically, your zone two needs to be 150 minutes per week. We keep belaboring that. But again, it doesn't have to be five sessions of 30 minutes. It could be 30 sessions of five minutes. Okay. But sitting all day increases your problems regardless of your exercise activity. Five to 10 minutes is a great starting point. Carrying your own groceries, park far away, things like that. Okay. So any movement's better than no movement. I think that's what I'm trying to emphasize here. I put this picture of Walmart's parking lot to show you just if you would on purpose park in the lots that are very not filled far away from the store and walk back and forth. Let's say it took you two minutes to walk to the store and then you're walking around the store, then two to three minutes back with your cart. You just added five more minutes of activity to your day just doing that. And that's just one errand you ran. So that's what I call opportunistic exercise. And a lot of people, they'll circle the parking lot to just get that closest lot no matter what. No, I got to get as close as I can to, this, to the door. I do the opposite. I try to park as far away as I can because I'm so busy. I don't get to exercise as much as I want to. So I try to grab it where I can. These are the things you got to start thinking about. Non-exercise physical activity, your NEPA. If you can't get out there 150 minutes a week to zone two walk with your buddies, then you got your NEPA your non-exercise physical activity. And at baseline, a high NEPA is better than anything, regardless of your exercise levels. You'll have a smaller waist, you'll have better levels of your HDL cholesterol, you'll have lower levels of your LDL cholesterol and your triglycerides, you'll have lower levels of insulin, lower levels of fibrinogen, which is a marker of inflammation, your glucose levels will normalize, and you will have lower levels of death. 
just from increasing your NEPA, your non-exercise physical activity. So if you don't think you have the time, the energy, or the ability to get out there and do an 11 minute brisk walk like we talked about, at least carry your own groceries from the parking lot to your, or, you know, from the far parking lot area, and then maybe hopefully carry it up the stairs yourself. Anything that you could possibly handle, you should do. Okay, so what happens with age if we don't exercise? We lose bones density. We, that's your osteoporosis, your osteopenia. We lose strength. We have cognitive decline. We get heart disease. We lose balance. We lose flexibility. We get stiff. Remember I told you you lose 3 to 8% of your muscle mass per year. You're also losing 1% to 3% of your bone density per year. More in women, particularly postmenopausal. This is when you start to see the kyphotic little hunched back people because their bone density becomes so low that just normal activities of life cause incremental compression fractures in the spine. And then falls, one per year and one third of those over the age of 65. And your fall risk increases with sarcopenia and osteopenia. So how do you fight that? How do you prevent it? Exercise. Yeah, we will. This video will be available um, on the website, web, website, Facebook, and YouTube if you want to watch it again or if you're signing in late. Okay, so I just showed you what aging does to you, but what does exercise prevent? Prevents the loss of bone density, prevents the loss of strength, prevents cognitive decline, prevents heart disease prevents the loss of balance, prevents the loss of flexibility. So you have at your fingertips the most massively powerful drug to combat aging ever known to man, and it's free, and it's called exercise. You just need to know what to do, how often to do it, and when to do it, and hopefully this is helping you with that. Here's some basic things you can do when you're sitting at the office at work. Most people get what, what um, some practitioners term forward cross X syndrome, where you're just like this all day, you're looking at a computer, you're scrolling, you're texting. So all these muscles get contracted and all these muscles get weak and then people have neck pain. So anything you can do to open the chest and increase the strength between the scapula and the, behind you and the posterior neck muscles, the better. And just simple things like this lady doing a wall push up here. That's a resistance exercise, okay? Especially if you're out of shape because you're using your body weight. A plank is a resistance exercise. Yoga is one of the best things you can do because it increases your flexibility and you're doing resistance against your own body weight. Um, so I'm a big fan of yoga in general as a way to do the resistance training part of this, okay? And there's different ways in yoga to increase the progressive overload. So you don't have to be Arnold out there, you know, pumping the iron. You can just do the wall push-ups like this or maybe some goblet squats with a half gallon of milk, okay? Anything you can do to fight the sarcopenia and the loss of bone will prevent the effects of aging. I'm not saying time won't pass. Time's a whole nother concept in physics. But what we th aging doesn't have to happen. I got a question about collagen supplements just now. Are they beneficial? Collagen is the most common protein in your body. Uh, but remember, your body has the ability to make whatever type of collagen, and I think there's, there's a lot of them. Uh, one and two are the most common in the musculoskeletal system. You can make collagen just from amino acids. So your body really just needs amino acids. And a lot of the collagen supplements, the way they get absorbed, they get broken down into the amino acids separately anyway. I don't think to date, and I could be wrong, the last time I looked at the literature, taking a collagen supplement is no more helpful than eating protein. Uh, I prefer to get my collagen um, by making homemade chicken stock, like with the bone to break down the animal protein into the soup stock and I get my collagen that way, or bone broth. Um, will collagen supplements hurt you? No. Could they help you? Probably, possibly. Uh, is it mandatory? No, but getting amino acids is. All right, so maybe aging isn't really aging, but it's just a lack of exercise. 
So all of what we think of as aging is really, we should just call it lack of exercising-itis or something. So the pillars of health are restorative sleep, good nutrition, and physical exercise, okay? And then also stress maintenance should be in there. You should not take your muscles for granted, okay? There's some people out there that don't have muscle function or can't or are paralyzed. Um, if, and that's not, that's, really kind of sad and there's a lot of science going on to try to combat that. Most of us have muscle and we just don't use it. We take it for granted. I don't think we should do that. I think we should get out there and use the body as it was meant to be used. The musculoskeletal system is integral to optimal aging. You cannot ignore it. You can't just take cholesterol pills and think you're gonna be fine. You've gotta use your musculoskeletal system. The muscles, bones, ligaments, tendons, fascia, the neural interface between the brain and body. Remember we talked about the dual task control. All of that connection and interconnection supports your balance and stability, protects your organs, allows aerobic and anaerobic capacities, and controls mitochondrial health, which in turn helps to regulate insulin and blood glucose levels. So you have to use your musculoskeletal system if you want to feel good. We have another question. Um, okay. We have an unrelated question about sleep gummies. Do they leave a sticky film on your teeth? Uh, when I take my sleep gummies, I don't have that issue. Not to say that they don't do that to other people. Um, and this person saying they need something to help them sleep. Sleep is a very complex thing. Uh, I like to use the gummies that we formulated and, and have at the well theory to sort of, uh, reduce the activity of glutamate and sort of reduce that hyperactivity of the brain to assist with the sleep. And of course, melatonin helps a bit and tart cherry helps. Um, but I'll tell you, I send a lot of my patients that have trouble sleeping. The first thing I do is send them for a sleep study because sometimes there's some major sleep dysfunctions that need to be addressed. Um, and maybe you're in that camp. There could be sleep apnea. There could be restless leg syndrome. There's a million reasons people don't sleep. Um, so a lot of times if I have a patient that tells me they're insomniac or this and that, I'll send them for a sleep study to get some objective data first. Uh, yeah, this person wants to calm down for sleep. You could do the calm gummies that has CBN and CBG, which can help. And if that doesn't work for you, then you try the one with melatonin. People respond to different molecules differently, depending on your overall nutritional status. So I wouldn't, I would test them one at a time, one type at a time, and see which one calms you the most. Another thing to remember for calming the brain is you have to take omega-3 every day. That's been shown to dramatically improve brain function and reduce brain inflammation and make your brain work better. So omega-3s, I think, is the basic thing to start with in the mornings. D3 needs to be optimized. Be active during the day. Get exposed to sunlight early in the morning. Wake up early and start dimming the light starting at around 5 p.m. to start inducing melatonin, then take the sleep calming gummies at that point. But, but there's a lot of other things you got to put in place um, to make the gummies work the best. All right, now back to exercise. Oh my God. <laughs> the question is, will exercise tighten your skin when your skin is flabby? Um, trying to think of where the skin would be flabby. I think if you're going to build muscle under flabby skin, the short answer would be yes. The second answer would be probably yes, because you will improve the health of the connective tissues. And flabby skin is just a sign of poor connective tissue function. Uh, and also everything in the body improves to include skin cells with exercise. So yes, it should improve. Will exercise get rid of all cellulite in the world? That I can't answer. I don't think anybody studied that. Okay. I'm getting lots of questions right now. We're going to get to a few of the supplements that would help with inflammation at the end of this talk. All right, let's move on. Okay. So sarcopenia and resistance training. Uh, I'm a huge fan of staying strong. And I think that's one thing, especially women are missing. A lot of females were not exposed to weightlifting. They didn't play sports. Um, that's changing now with newer generations. But um, one of the reasons a lot of women get frail as they get older is because they lack muscle. 
So again, you lose three to 8% of your muscle mass per decade after the age of 30, two to 3% of bone mineral density. And I think it's actually more than that. It may be per year, not decade. Um, and then after the age of 60, there's even more rapid loss. Now I will throw this out there that I think what happens is after the age of 60, people stop being active for some reason, even though in theory, many are retired and should be more active, right? Now all of a sudden you got all the time to go do the kettlebell work. Uh, but for some reason, people stop doing it. So they get increased marbling of the muscle, which is a sign of insulin resistance and fatty deposits inside the muscle. There's a loss of power and strength. And again, there's an association between the loss of muscle power and the level of fatty infiltration. So when I get those MRIs of people's lumbar spines and neck, and I see all that marbling in the paraspinal posture muscles, I know they have no strength and power. And of course, their back hurts. More fat starts to be gained than muscle is lost. And then this makes the measure of the BMI, which I know you probably have all had that checked at your primary care office. The BMI starts to become more and more irrelevant as you become more and more sarcopenic, okay? Uh, because you could have a normal BMI, but be skinny fat, right? Like no muscle and all fat and your BMI is normal, but really you're not normal. You're metabolically dysfunctional. And humans have a tendency to overvalue immediate goals and underestimate the value of long-term goals. That's why I don't want you to focus on four additive years of life that you'll get when you're 90 because you're exercising today. I want you to think about how you're going to feel amazing when you're done exercising. Tomorrow, you're going to feel even better. You're going to sleep well tonight. You're going to be able to play with your grandkids next week. You're going to get stronger. You're going to be able to help other people carry their groceries. You're not going to have to ask for help. Like life will be better. Those are the goals you need to focus on and then start getting your kettleball going. And then the big question I get from a lot of patients is, well, it hurts. Physical therapy hurts. So this is when I get an understanding of, did they play sports before? Did they ever exercise before? Do they know what muscle soreness feels versus normal you know, pain? So a lot of people equate muscle soreness, which is normal with exercise, to tissue damage, okay? Remember, pain does not always mean tissue damage. So exercise should cause some muscle soreness or you're not using your muscles. So a little bit of soreness is actually normal and beneficial when it comes to exercise. Um, <clears throat> exercise over time reduces all chronic pain. So you might have exercise soreness, but your hurt will diminish over time. 50% of the United States has a chronic musculoskeletal uh, condition, back pain, arthritis, joint pain, I think total knee arthroplasties are the most commonly done surgery now. All of this is as prevalent as hypertension. And musculoskeletal problems, which that is what all of that pain is from, they're from a lack of activity and systemic inflammation. Exercise reduces inflammation over time and you get natural shock absorbers around all your joints. Your muscles work better and your bones are better and your cartilage improves in terms of function. So you will feel better and have less pain if you exercise, although you might have a bit of muscle soreness right after you exercise, okay? Well, technically the best time of walking, if you want to get good sleep, is in the morning. So it's really good to get out and get early morning um, rays of sunlight. Uh, so that is a very efficient time to walk because you, you get your cortisol to spike in the morning, which gets your day going. You get that needed low level sunlight into your system, which also gets your day going. And then that in turn gets your cortisol melatonin oscillation improved and you sleep better. So I think Anything that induces cortisol should be done early in the day. So if I had a perfect schedule, I would wake up and walk as the sun was rising. Is that a question or is that, is that you? Okay. My producer has a question. Um, yeah. Walking after a meal pulls glucose out of the bloodstream. So after dinner, should you take a five to 10 minute walk, even if it's dark outside? Yes. But if you're trying to do your 11 minute brisk walk, I would do that in the morning. Should you still try to walk a little bit after dinner? Yes. Okay, exercise and inflammation. So we know that non-communicable chronic diseases like emphysema, COPD, bronchitis, asthma, stroke, heart disease, uh, hyperlipidemia, arthritis, musculoskeletal conditions, diabetes, cancer, you name it, all of that is from chronic inflammation and oxidative stress, which really is from mitochondrial dysfunction and insulin resistance. 
So exercise can help your mitochondria work better, reduce the levels of fatty acids that are stored inside of a cell, which is extremely damaging and causative of insulin resistance. It will reduce your levels of insulin resistance. It will change uh, the inflammatory mediators or the cytokine ratio that's in your blood and in and around the joints. So exercise increases levels of cytokines that are anti-inflammatory over time and decreases things like tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is pro-inflammatory. And obesity and insulin resistance do the opposite. Well, thank you, Marsha. I hope so. I mean, I think that a lot of us are taught to be intimidated and we don't need to be. Okay. We're all allowed to be healthy, not just um, Tom Brady, right? All right. Exercise reduces inflammation. That's what we're talking about now. So it improves your mitochondria, the engine of the cell. Remember, that's a little organelle that does the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain and makes fuel for you, the ATP from the food you eat. You, your mitochondria work better if you exercise. You have better control of your lactate better control of reactive oxygen species, and far less oxidative stress over time, which means your DNA doesn't get mutated as much, the proteins don't get damaged as much, the cell membranes don't get damaged as much, and everything works better. Higher levels of activity produce lower levels of CRP and IL-6. Those are the pro-inflammatory cytokines we just talked about. And remember that slide before that I showed you higher levels of activity mean a longer life and fewer diseases? This is why, because you have less inflammation. And we don't know if that's because people that exercise more tend to have less adiposity or fat, or if it's activity itself that's still being worked out. Fat makes bad inflammatory cytokines. That's why you don't want to have excess fat on you. And then there's shifts in the immune function with exercise that reduce inflammation. And then exercise also upregulates the genes that produce your natural antioxidants. So there's really nothing bad that anyone can find about exercise. It's all good. And here's some more easy, simple things you can do. Planks are great. That's a great core resistance exercise using your body weight. Okay, and mountain climbers, also great. Squat jumps, a little bit more advanced. A lot of people won't be able to do that, so start with some goblet squats. Uh, a million things you can do to use your muscles, but you just got to get out there and do it. We have another question. Okay, well, that's a tough, complicated question. Somebody just asked, who's four months out from a total knee replacement, who's having mobility issues, she can't regain full flexion. Okay, so four months after total knee replacement, you should have full flexion by then. Um, sometimes that means there's a bunch of scar tissue in the joint. It could mean that there's something with the implant itself that's blocking the motion. It could be that the quadriceps tendon is adhesed down from the exposure. Lack of full motion, full motion over four months after a total knee replacement may not be fixable with just some simple exercise. I'm sure you've been in physical therapy and I'm sure your physical therapist has worked with you. Some people have to go get a manipulation under anesthesia. Some people have to have a surgery to release all the scar tissue. Uh, lack of flexion after a total knee arthroplasty is a different ball of wax. The simple things is like a jogger stretch where you stand and you grab your ass up to your butt. That stretches your quad. Stretching the hamstring sometimes helps a little bit. It's the opposite muscle group, but there's some reciprocal benefits. Um, the lunges might help, uh, but I would work really with a physical therapist pretty closely, and then you may need to go get that worked up. Um, that may require a little bit more work, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh, the work meaning like they might need another surgery. I hope not. I hope I'm wrong. Okay. So exercise, this is just really showing you at one and a half hours post-exercise, one and a half to a full day post-exercise, full day to three days post-exercise, all of the beneficial physiologic things that happen. So you release all of the anti-inflammatory cytokines. Um, and basically you will have short-term increase in inflammation because of the stress of exercise, but the hormesis, the stress response of exercise trains the mitochondria and improves them. And over time you have systemically much less inflammation. And that's why you feel better and have fewer diseases and have better brain health. So another question I get is, 
mostly because people have been told this by other physicians, I find, won't exercise damage my joints? No. There is a clear relationship between knee pain and osteoarthritis and a lack of extensor strength or extensor weakness. So that is after the total knee arthroplasty, the people that can't um, fully straighten their leg, that is a lack of extensor weakness. Or if you strengthen your leg and somebody pushes down, if you can't keep it straight, even when they're pushing as hard as they can, that's a lack of quad strength. So the people that have weaker legs hurt more that have arthritis. So exercise reduces pain. Strengthening the quad reduces pain a lot. Resistance training increases the muscle mass and improves the neuromuscular control between the brain and the joints. So there's less um, micromotion, the joint's more stable and it works better. And so there's less pain. And then most pain that is associated with exercise is not joint pain per se, it's DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness. So this goes back to the soreness thing. So sedentary people just aren't used to that delayed onset muscle soreness that happens. So this pictograph sort of shows you all of the benefits from resistance exercise in terms of joint pain. It actually makes everything much better. It won't damage your joints. They've done many studies, long-term people that run a lot, people that don't run a lot, and running is protective of joints, assuming you don't have a massively crooked joint when you're running. But in general, the cartilage responds to load and use, okay, and it actually gets healthier, as do the ligaments and tendons and bone and muscle. The improved muscle function and strength makes your shock absorption better and gives you better biomechanics. There's reduced systemic inflammation like we talked about, which makes all of your joint health better because cartilage doesn't like inflammation any more than your heart does, okay, or the brain. And then the brain has better function and you're happier because exercise has been shown to be helpful to treat depression and mood disorders. It's been shown to help with stress management. And we know there's a very strong association between stress depression and pain. So if you could control those aspects, you'll also feel better. And then again, long distance running does not cause osteoarthritis. The disability in runners has been found to be about 25% of the disability found in non-runners. So people think running is bad for their joints. It's actually protective of joints. Okay, next slide, please. Walk for the health, like what else can they incorporate in the daily walk to build stamina and strength, the general level, like carry and weight, or the question is what else Hold on. can I incorporate in my daily walk to build stamina and strength? Uh, what else can I incorporate in my daily walk to build stamina and strength? Well, I mean the first thing to do is get out there and walk. The second thing is add distance, you know. 10% per week is general rule uh, when you're training. Uh, and then increase speed. Uh, bring a buddy and try to talk to him. Because remember, you're not at zone two unless you're having difficulty carrying on a conversation while you're walking. If you're just out there strolling, you're just still in zone one in maintenance. So you need to walk briskly. So you want to increase speed. You want to get to the point where it's hard to carry on a conversation. Then if you're doing all of that and you're walking for like two or three hours, add a weight vest. But that's a simple way. You can get these vests and just add half a pound, a pound, whatever you want to um, increase the resistance that is added to that aerobic capacity. So those are simple things you can do. I wouldn't want to carry hand weights because that would be annoying. I would wear an eight, a weight vest. Okay, five proven facts about exercise. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. There's no threshold that has to be reached to achieve benefits. Walking five minutes a day is as beneficial as 30 minutes. Is your goal 150 minutes a week? Yes, but you got to start somewhere. The max benefit was seen in the people that went from zero to about 90 minutes a week. So there's no threshold to get benefits. The bouts of your physical activity can be less than 10 minutes at a time to count, okay? Lifestyle physical activity helps. So one to two minutes of intense activity like carrying heavy groceries while climbing the stairs or just climbing the stairs to your office or apartment or whatever. And then excessive sitting, especially sitting after work, so your leisure sitting, is damaging if it's not combined with daily life physical activity. So if you have a sedentary desk job and you come home and sit, that is your worst combination. Resistance training is essential. You can't just be a runner. You have to lift weights or do something that improves your muscle mass. And then physical activity is strongly protective of brain health. Even a single bout of exercise can improve cognitive function.
So just please just share and do something because it's going to help your brain. Um, and I, you know, that's probably the primary benefit, I think. Next. Okay. So a good starting protocol. I tell my patients that have desk jobs, just try to get up from your desk, set a timer. What? Get up from your desk once an hour for just five minutes and move around. Over an eight-hour day times five is 40. That gives you 40 minutes of physical activity that you didn't have before. Okay? And then if you can, get out and walk 10 to 30 minutes at zone two in the morning. Sunlight has countless benefits for mood, for sleep, for overall health and well-being. So being exposed to natural sunlight, the photons of the sun in the morning is awesomely beneficial. And try to do something cognitive at the same time to improve that dual task control ability. So talk to someone, listen to a podcast, I don't know, think about some math problem, whatever. Just try to do something cognitive while you're walking. That's also helpful. And then a couple of times a week, and we talked about the three to five protocol, but two to three times a week, you need to lift something heavy or move something heavy. And that might be your own body weight. You may just be able to do a plank or a wall sit up or something. Um, whole body movements, the three to five system. So three to five exercises, three to five days a week, three to five reps, 70% of your max ability. Um, with uh, three to five days a week. And remember to eat a little bit more protein than that maintenance 50 grams a day. Okay, so that's just a basic, super basic starting protocol. Next. All right. Um, okay, all right. Hold on. Is this a... Okay. There was a question. Uh... Okay. Sorry. I just having technical difficulties here. Um, we already talked about NMN. That increases the levels of NAD, which is that primary electron shuttle from the Krebs cycle to the mitochondria to help with that aerobic capacity and your mitochondrial health. Turmeric is great because turmeric and the ginger in the joint health multi that we have reduce the inflammatory mediators in the joint, and it will actually help you feel better while you're starting your exercise protocol. So a lot of people that already have arthritis pain, I put them on the joint health multi in the morning and tart cherry extract at night, because and that combination seems to be very, very effective at, at controlling pain associated with the musculoskeletal system. Um, it reduces the overall inflammatory cytokines, which helps your mitochondrial health. Then you can do more exercise uh, and get, you know, basically a synergistic bang for your buck there. We talked about the omega-3. I think this is massively important in general. It helps your brain function better. It makes all of the cell membranes function better, makes them more flexible and viable, and it reduces inflammation in the cell membranes. And omega-3s actually also reduce the levels of inflammatory cytokines overall. So you'll get, if you're taking omega-3s, your brain's going to work better. You'll have le less inflammation. And then the exercise reduction in inflammation, that will be additive. And just the life improvement effects of that is going to be amazing. And then alpha lipoic acid is a very powerful antioxidant that actually is able to get into the cell membranes and act as an antioxidant and in the cytosol or the cell fluid and act as an antioxidant. It's lipophilic and hydrophilic. So it likes water and fat. Most antioxidants prefer one or the other. Vitamin C likes water, vitamin E likes fat. Alpha lipoic acid, it can do both and is really powerful for reducing inflammation and oxidative stress around nerve endings, which helps with a lot of pain. And I put the, a lot of my neuropathic patients on this. So a lot of people have neuropathy and that is one of the reasons they don't exercise. So taking alpha lipoic acid and then just doing the short five minute bouts more often will help reduce inflammation and reduce pain over time. And then the energy supplement is just a series of um, bioactive mushroom molecules, which are very, very beneficial for the brain. So the tart cherry, I already talked about it. All right, so the important thing for you to know is start somewhere, don't be intimidated. You can do less than or more than 10 minutes in a bout and you're still gonna get benefits. Zone two is your go-to goal, okay? And then you just wanna 
fight sarcopenia, please. Don't let society get you weak. Fight it back and be strong. All right, now we're gonna do our free giveaway, CoQ10. I mentioned it very briefly. CoQ10 shuttles electrons along the electron transport chain and is very, very important for energy production and mitochondrial health. Uh, so, and it's very good for treating muscle soreness and pain. And it's actually been shown to help with migraine headaches, things like that. So we're gonna give away some of our CoQ10 gummies, which also have the tart cherry, also highly anti-inflammatory. Oh, we haven't determined the winner. Once we do, we will contact the winner and ship the CoQ10 to the winner. All right, if you have any last questions, please ask them now. Somebody's asking about when I said wait three days between exercising the same muscle. Yeah, that's for resistance training. If you're doing a true strength protocol and you're doing three sets of three exercises with three reps each with three minutes between and you're doing them at 70% of your maximum one rep max, then you need to give your body a few days to synthesize and build protein before you overload the muscle again. So yeah, if you're going to be doing mostly heavy arm stuff, you would want to wait on the arm stuff for two to three days. Um, a good healthy longevity strength protocol uses multiple muscle groups all at once. So in general, you would just wait two to three days between sessions, mostly just so your body can adapt and repair and synthesize protein. So that takes a little bit. Okay. Okay, so this is a 61 year old who just had his first bout of gout. Um, and his podiatrist wants to send him to a rheumatologist and he may or may not be put on allopurinol. Uh, he's very stressed with a new job. Let's start taking our tart cherry, which is levels of acid in the blood, which helps with gout flares. Um, tart cherry is great for gout flares, actually. Uh, he wants to know what else he should do. So I will tell you that levels of gout and rates of gout have been increasing exponentially globally. And we think it's because of the high levels of fructose found in many ultra processed foods. So fructose is metabolized in a similar fashion to alcohol. And gout is brought on by like beer, the purines in beer, and also by purine heavy foods. And fructose goes down a similar pathway and will end up with the same levels of uric acid. Um, so you should avoid any juices or any high fructose corn syrup. Anything with added fructose is the first thing you should do for gout. The second, obviously, is avoid, you know, crawfish and red meat and all that stuff. Um, tart cherry is great. Um, but ma managing your insulin resistance and levels of fructose is the first thing you should do. Allopurinol is a great medicine. It definitely controls gout. And actually, a lot of people that have been put on allopurinol prophylactically end up with less chronic communicable diseases because it controls the inflammation levels of uric acid, which is, like I said, brought on by our newer lifestyles with ultra processed foods. So if you eat a lot of ultra processed foods, first of all, stop doing that. Second of all, avoid fructose at all costs. Don't drink juice. Um, and then try to modify your diet. Otherwise, that'll help your gout a lot. Oh, the giveaway is based on the number of likes and shares and comments. So we're trying to encourage interactivity. Yeah, you can watch this talk again on Facebook, the website, etc. We haven't done um, a downloadable PowerPoint yet, but that 
maybe we'll look into that in the future. So that's a great question. Yeah, a lot of this information will be in the book that I told you, which, which is why we haven't done our webinar in the past few months, because I've been working on a book talking about natural ways to treat the pain of musculoskeletal conditions um, and to get your body healthy. A lot of it will be in that. But yeah, the talk will be available, but not necessarily the downloadable PowerPoint. We don't, we haven't done that yet, but that's a good idea. Okay, somebody just asked, can I run with plantar fasciitis or will it prolong the healing process? So A, we have to make sure that's the real diagnosis because some things mimic plantar fasciitis. But let's say you have true plantar fasciitis. Will running damage it or prolong the healing process? Uh, it depends on if you're a heel strike runner or a midfoot toe striker, okay, because that's different. Groups are being stressed more. Actually, toe and midfoot stresses all of the fascia a little bit more because of the eccentric loads. But once you get in shape for that, it's actually better over time. Um, I would say as long as you stretch afterwards, ice it down, take some anti-inflammatories, I think the human body is more than able to heal plantar fasciitis, even if you run on it. Now, the pain is a whole different thing. Is it going to hurt so much that you don't want to run? Maybe. Um, I tell my patients to let pain be their guide because you can't really make that condition any worse than it's going to be because it's really a degenerative condition and a problem with... Um, oxidative stress over time and advanced glycation end products being deposited in collagen tendon structures. Um, but that's assuming it's, that's the true diagnosis. So in, in short, if you do in fact just have plantar fasciitis, you should be able to run a little bit while it's healing. You just want to give your body the ability to heal it. So rest between bouts of running, you know, give it some time, stretch, take some anti-inflammatories and antioxidants. And I don't mean synthetic ones because those slow down healing um, of soft tissue. So like Celebrex and ibuprofen, all that actually slows down soft tissue healing. I would say more natural anti-inflammatories. And then of course the healing sole, which was, um, you know, the shoe I designed to treat plantar fasciitis and foot pain. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. Oh, okay. Protein drinks. Oh, somebody asked if protein drinks are something I recommend. Uh, depends on if you're making it yourself and or if you're adding sugar. If it's a store-bought ultra-processed protein drink, I would say no, it's not good for you. If you're making a smoothie yourself and adding some, some kind of relatively benign protein powder, although of course those are all processed too, right? Um, and you're not adding sugar, then it could be potentially beneficial, yes. But I think, yeah, the Mediterranean diet and eating real whole foods that you find in nature is probably the best way to go. So edamame, grass-fed beef, things like that. Okay. Oh my God. All right. This is a very hard question to answer. Somebody said they're overwhelmed with the amount of supplements. What should they take and how should they think about it? Did I get that right? Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot to answer. So when people come to me in my clinic, I kind of try to find out what their goal in life is. Like what are they really trying to achieve with the supplements they're taking? Um, because you would take one group if your goal was longevity. You would take another group if you're trying to treat arthritis pain. You would take another group if you're worried about just brain health. Um, and then there's your basics that you really, all of us should be on, like vitamin D3, omega-3, um, NMN, I think most of us should probably be on as well, but that's in the longevity realm. Yeah, I have the same problem. I take almost all of my supplements almost every day, but what I do is I'll just cycle some of them take a little holiday from one or two of them periodically. Um, and if I miss a day, I don't freak out about it. Um, but I take, because I take them consistently enough every day um, that I think I'm getting the benefit of all the different groups. I think the most important are probably for fundamental health is connective tissue multi because it has calcium, zinc, magnesium, D3, and those are all just fundamental. Um, and then 
I like to take alpha lipoic acid because it is that lipophilic and hydrophilic antioxidant. It's really good for brain health and nerve health. And then omega-3, I think, is pretty much mandatory. Uh, and then the joint health multi, I will take periodically. I don't really ever have any pain, probably because of, you know, I've really made my life very healthy. Um, but, but I'll take the joint health multi periodically just to get the added gut and heart benefits of turmeric. Um, the energy and the focus I take periodically too, to really just help with brain health because of the lion's mane and the reishi and the chaga. I take NMN every day in the morning with something fatty. Um, I take resveratrol every day and I take omega-3 every day. Um, but yeah, it is hard to do. I think if you're just looking for fundamental life health, I would do the omega-3 tart cherry at night, um, the NMN, the D3s. And then based on if you're having arthritis pain, that's when you throw in the joint health multi and the tart cherry. Um, if you're having nerve pain, you would do PEA and alpha lipoic acid. Uh, if you're just worried about brain health, you would do alpha lipoic acid, the nervous system multi, the omega-3. If you're having sleep issues, you would go to the sleep gummies. But remember, you don't, you don't just rely on a sleep gummy. You also need to start dimming your lights in the evening to start producing natural melatonin production. You can't look at blue light late at night. You need to turn all your TV settings to warm so you're not blasted with blue light all the time. You need to wake up early. You need to be exposed to sunlight early in the day. All of that helps your sleep. And then the gummies work better that way, I think. So that's a tough question to answer, but these, it's a great question. Um, we would just need to talk a little bit more about personal goals and like the rest of your life. Like, what is your diet like? What is your sleep like? Do you exercise? What's your stress level? How do you manage your stress? All those kind of questions. And then of course we have our liver line. We just came out with Wakewell, which is I formulated to help people manage alcohol metabolism. So if you are gonna drink, uh, it helps your body manage that alcohol. So it makes it hopefully a little bit less toxic. And then uh, the liver series, which is like a two-week detox. So you wouldn't take that every day all the time. Um, so it's a great question. I probably didn't answer it really at all. But uh, we would just need to discuss goals, I guess, on a personal level. Okay. And then Marla, she has a question. I mean, really has a question about one of those guys. She says, yes, I have two parents. They're both in their 70s. Thanks for designing them. Well, tell her thank you and to check out the Marlo or Marley? Mary Lou. Oh, Mary Lou. So Mary Lou is our runner with plantar fasciitis. She does have the healing soul and says it does help her. Yeah, so if you're a regular runner and you put in a significant number of miles and you have persistent heel pain that's not really responding to normal treatments, I would say you may not have true plantar fasciitis. Um, I see a lot of people that have jogger's nerve, which is compression of the medial plantar nerve. Um, and it mimics plantar fasciitis, super common in runners because this one muscle belly is always pushing on it. Um, so maybe something to think about. And then the boot, like the boot, Louisiana. Oh, oh, she wants me to tell you about the healing soul boot. Yes, we did finally come out with some closed toes. We have a mule and a boot. Okay, Nancy said, uh, focusing on what her actual health goals are, what she's trying to achieve will be helpful in guiding, I guess, her supplement recipe for life. Yeah, I mean, I get it. You know, if in a perfect world, health insurance would cover these things and preventative medicine and exercise would be a covered service, right? And then we wouldn't have to worry about anything. It's not a perfect world. So a lot of us do have to pick and choose. Um, and, you know, maybe you have multiple goals. So you quarter one, you do this, quarter two, you do that, quarter three, you do that, you know, cycle. And that way it's not a huge outlay and you're not taking a pound of supplements every day. I get it. All right. Everybody have a great day.